Sākoties karam 14. gadā Kijeviete aizbrauc uz Donbasu, kā brīvprātīgā. Pēc tam uzrakstīja grāmatu. Mēs nolēmām tikties nesen atvērtā kafēnīcā aizstāvis Ukraiņu valodā. Par toreiz pieredzēto un jauno kara ikdienu – Tamār Duda – viens pret vienu. Tamara Vitaju, uh, when we uh, called the managers of this pub mm -hmm. to arrange this interview, uh, they said it's a very good place, you know, and, and uh, this place you can use as a bomb shelter as well, very convenient. And, yeah. you know, at, at first it was like, you know, a, bit, a little like kind of shock. And actually, mm -hmm. I, I'd like to ask a question about this new normal. What's a new normal now in Kyiv? Yeah, we are move, moving from shelter to shelter actually, and every time we are noticing and paying attention, for example, for uh, big windows, open spaces, and um, I always remember, I every second I know, for example, where my kids are, what are they doing there, where they stay. Uh, the same is about parents, about friends. Uh, every hour we're making calls or sending messages. I'm okay, I'm here, I'm there. Uh, I can say it's normal, uh, but it's inevitable thing. Yeah. We are we here in war and uh, the Kiev is the capital of uh, the state in, this, in war. You know? uh, luckily, uh, in, in spring, we were here as a front line, front city, front, yeah, and we stayed and Kyiv was getting ready to street fights. For example, trenches were digged in uh, yards, in, uh, on, uh, along all major streets. Uh, my house, windows of my apartment faced trenches and uh, soldiers and I, I was doing for example, pizza or some bread and bring it to them, start uh, near my house. Yeah, they were, uh, we, we all uh, were getting ready to street war, street fights and to war in our city. Luckily, uh, we managed to evade it and to escape, but... Mm -hmm. and, and you went to, with your kids, you went to Riga, Latvia as well for some weeks and then came back. It's like kind of way to endure the war to make some, you know, holidays or vacations, how do you call it? Every, everyone in Riga, all, all our friends are, were asking us why we're uh, going back, why we're going to Kiev in such. Uh, we were invited and stayed in Riga uh, upon invitation of Dacia Vagante, uh, your writer. It's a friend of mine, a colleague, and she said, you can stay here anytime. Uh, Four months, four year, four years, uh, any any times. So all you need, please stay. Please have a heavy time, have a shelter, have a rest. Uh, it was so kind. Uh, it's so I was so pleased. But you know, I couldn't. I couldn't because my kids uh, kept asking me every day when we are going to Kiev, when we are going back to our home, and I have a strong feeling that I have to be here. Uh, with my country, with my city, with my Ukraine, uh, with all that people I love, I appreciate, and uh, I have to do something to support and to make them more happier, stronger, maybe. Uh, so we just yeah. right here. Uh, I'm not sure. Is it a right decision or wrong? If it's up to me, an adult person. Surely I would never go abroad. I would never evacuate to uh, Europe. Mm. I would stay here. Uh, it's uh, without question. So it's go, go as, it, as it is. But uh, it's about my kids, about children. And you know, every day I'm looking at them. I'm saying them good night, have a nice sleep. And uh, I used to tell my uh, youngest son, she's six, 
uh, then putting him to bed, I say him, you're here, you're in safe position, you're in safety, you're with your mom, I will respond, I will do everything, you, you can sleep well, nothing wrong will happen to you this night, every night, every evening. It's our small ritual, it's, it's our small tradition from his mm, childhood, but now I understand that telling it every, every night, every evening, I'm lying to him because I can't arrange, a, I can't guarantee that he and my daughter and I would wake up next morning. We, we all, every time we have such feeling and it's so hard. On the one hand, their li lives, their friends, their school, their environment, their toys are here in Kiev and the Ukrainians. On the other hand, I'm responsible for their safety, first and foremost. And no one could uh, give me some keys and some tools to resolve this properly. Yeah. And what about your husband? He's on a battlefield. Yeah. He's fighting in Donetsk, in Bakhmut. Uh, 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 on 24th of February last year, after the first sheltering, after the first bombing, he gathered and went to uh, first he enrolled to the uh, local self-defense unit, Territoriala Oberona, and later on he signed a contract with the uh, arm, army, and uh, for, he uh, was in in the east of Ukraine. Uh, they liberated her son, and the the unit entered her son. Uh, among the first ones, and then after that he moved his switch to the Donetsk direction and is staying there. Mm -hmm. You said about rituals with your kids. Do you have some rituals with your husband? How to communicate every day? Every day I write him, how are you? And he, say, he answers, plus, with a sign, maybe <laughs> it's short conversations. He, they have no time. They have no time to answer calls, to write. They have very limited resources and very limited time to sleep. They slept uh, for maybe two, three hours per, per day. It's, uh, they're exhausted, but also they are very determined. It's a decision and it's a behavior and it's acts of adult men who makes his own decision, who has chosen it by himself. He said, I have to protect my family my kids, you and my state, and I'm going to fight. I will do everything I can to stop them there in the east of Ukraine and not let them enter Kyiv and Kyiv region again. Yeah. When we drove by, uh, by car to Kyiv, we uh, saw a billboard uh, by the highway that was written something in Ukrainian, Chlopci, we cosmos, uh, uh, Ukraina s vami. Uh, <laughs> This is a feeling in all of Ukraine to support the army, to armed forces, and just to cheer them up. Um, of course, it's a, it's a it's a reality. It's a reality because um, uh, only official figures, as far as I know, they say we have about one million people in army now. Uh, one million men are fighting or summoned or have training, some military training in Ukraine, you know, in, in different units, in, in various forces. But it's, it's a huge number of people uh, for, for, for Ukraine, the, which is about 30 million, maybe 30, 35, I don't know, up to 40, you know. Um, and uh, much more, uh, actually everyone, I guess, is doing something to support our army. We, are, uh, we see all obstacles, so we see all problems, and we are trying to do what we can at our, on our places, uh, donate to army, buy belongings, buy, buy ammunition, uh, support their families, uh, support widows, support uh, children. Uh, it's, uh, we have very strong community ties and resources uh, engaged in this war. It's not about, you know, uh, supreme power and or some orders or uh, directions from above. We have 
everything on horizontal levels and on face-to-face, -face, friend to friend ties, you know. Uh, they, I can say I have friends and relatives actually in, in every unit, in, in every mm, battalion or brigade, you know. Mm. I, would, I would like to come back to, to, to your story. Uh, you, uh, the war uh, for you started in 2014, yes. as for many Ukrainians, and uh, you became a volunteer. Um, tell about this beginning, how it, how it started. Well, it was totally a mess. For uh, about maybe several months, but by, by, by the summer of fourteenth, I was expecting every day that it would terminate, it will end today or next week. Uh, f initially, it was um, perceived as a short-term uh, violence, short-term terroristic attack, maybe, and we treated them like terrorists. Who, um, and, and we were expecting that our own army would stand and defend us. We were expecting that you know world, world community would interfere and say they would. And it, it was something absolutely unbelievable. Uh, Russians grabbed Crimea, for example, and Donetsk and declared, declared Crimea officially their territory. It's a part of our land and we had total silence. No one, no United Nations, no European institutions interfered and protected Ukraine. Uh, we said it, it can be the truth, you know, because uh, we um, gave up our nuclear weapon in 19th and we were expected that some guarantees would be applied, mm -hmm. you know, in, in our favor. And it, it didn't happen. So, uh, in summer, uh, Kiev, summer 14th, uh, Kiev uh, hospitals were packed with wounded persons, uh, soldiers, and it, it looked, and then I understood it's not a terroristic act, it's a not short time, short term, because I visited the hospital with my friends, uh, well, and then in another, I went there and I saw, you know, um, it was initial idea, maybe one, maybe dozens of people. I expected to see them dozens. And I went there to our central hospital in Kiev and I saw hundreds, hundreds of men wounded with severe wounds. And I, I, I went back home, home and I said, you know, it looks like we have war. It's, it's a war. It's a war with Russia, not mm -hmm. separatists, not Donetsk criminals, not Titushka. Titushki, we will call them, uh, they are supporters of Yanukovych, uh, mainly, mainly marginal people who went to Kiev to Maidan and uh, arranged some provocations and some fights with uh, our people. And uh, as soon as, as I realized it's a real war, I, I naturally, it, for me it was quite naturally, I started to um, thinking, what, what shall I do, how can I help? my state, my Ukraine, my, my army. And uh, for some weeks I went to the hospital every day and helped uh, to do some necessary work, you know, I, uh, like sanitary. And then I, uh, the first shock ended and I recalled that I have uh, some experience in uh, customs in uh, logistics, in delivering goods, in arranging um, accounting, and making registries, and uh, some financial aspects of trade, uh, external and internal. And I all make first orders for uh, military ammunition from USA and from Europe. And actually, in Dota, uh, my experience is well depicted because I also reached uh, Ukrainian churches. In, in Europe and USA and Canada. And actually, I, saw, I am a first-hand witness of many events, many um, battles, many processes uh, which took place 
in the east of Ukraine, in Donetsk region, back in 14th and 15th. You said in one interview that uh, you and your husband, you were um, carrying grenade in your car, driving to, to, to the front line, but because not to fighting, but, but in a case you have to kill yourself. Yeah. It's, yeah. It was so, you know... Yeah, I had, I, I, had, I had several ones. I have uh, one is a glove box the chalk and another one or maybe two of them under my seat and uh, to my surprise you know our car was never searched uh, at um, when we live in the uh, uh, war area you know front line and when I go into Kiev sometimes I forgot to leave it at, 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 uh, and we, we brought it here in Kiev and uh, it, it occurred to me oh gosh I have a granite in my car I, I have to do something I have to put it in a safe, maybe a safe box, I don't know, where we came from a war. Yeah, uh, for me uh, it was clear that uh, that war was not like anything we saw, for example, in films and movies. Because the, then there was no strict lines as, and strict uh, division between a peaceful territory and uh, territory, uh, Ukrainian territory and territory occupied by Russians and uh, locals, local separatists, you know. It was the so-called gray zone, very wide. For example, for initially it was about maybe 50 kilometers in, uh, in width. Yeah. It was a huge territory, uh, no, uh, not controlled by Ukrainian authorities and not controlled by, by Russians. And uh, then you are, you are going by uh, for example, field road, Runtavaya uh, Doroha, field road. Uh, on the one hand, there are uh, fields with corn. On the other hand, you see uh, forests, maybe, or another fields, and uh, uh, a small line is clear. And then we, you, you bump into a tree lying across the road. And I, s I stay in the car. And Sviat going outside to remove this, this um, tree. And I understand it's well, maybe a, a trip. Yeah, and uh, we were sitting and waiting for shots. And I'm taking in both my hand, not for them, because I have weak hands, I can throw it for, for uh, a long, uh, long distance, but for myself, because two volunteers in a car packed with military equipment and all other stuff, it's a uh, price for them. You know, and uh, Sviat had a lot of patriotic tattoos on him. He had um, from Maidan tattoos with our Maidan people yeah. and, and had, you know, it, it's very, uh, uh, can, can be hide it. And I, I, I understand uh, the capture meant for us torturing and very painful death. After rape, af after cutting breasts, hands, parts of the body. And uh, for us it was clear that uh, in, it should be better to, to have Grenade. I see. You, I, I think that um, people in Donbass and Crimea, they lived peaceful life with different, let's say, mm -hmm. political perceptions or attitudes, but peaceful life. What turns, turned them into separatists and separs? Uh, do you know the answer? What was this, uh, you know, key issue? Uh, you know, uh, the trick is that they were not turned into separatists. Uh, because uh, we should clearly understand that TV picture was far from reality. It was not, it was not the truth. People were living like ordinary people. They had some affiliation or some negative or positive emotions, for example, toward Maidan, towards Kiev. Yeah? Uh, it's, it's natural. It was uh, a region uh, having the same features, the same distribution of political and um, our polls didn't uh, separate Donetsk into a specific region. It was like any other. Uh, Russians, uh, first uh, they used their 
soldiers and the uh, people who were brought to Donetsk by uh, buses, by trains. Uh, Donetsk in 14 was fled with strangers. Uh, it's not about hundreds, it is tens of thousands. People from Russia were brought to Donetsk to uh, create some specific pictures for television, for the Russia TV, TV and also to uh, do a lot of provocations, ag agitations, and so on. It's, it's one. Then, uh, Russians uh, carefully and uh, persistently uh, sold and found uh, aliens from locals. They paid, they promised a lot. They uh, used all, for example, then uh, working with young people in teens. They said to teens, to teenagers, that uh, we're having the great events similar, for example, to um, Russia revolutions in uh, Bolshevik revolution. Right. Uh, we are on the eve, we are in the midst of great revolutions, and you will be heroes of that revolution. You are making new history. Okay, I see. And for kids? Some kind of propaganda, of course. Yeah. It, it, it was very uh, inspiring, you know? Okay, I just, in that case, I just want to quote your book. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a fiction book, of course, but based on your experience uh, this, about this local people, you cannot fight in a city where you do not have the eyes and ears of the locals. In an ideal world, I would have gone behind the line, got to know the commanders and offered my services. In our reality, however, it would be cheaper and less trouble just to put an advert in the newspaper saying, I am so and so, I'm leaking information about the opportunity to the Ukrainians, my addresses, and if, and if you know what I mean. So uh, how about these people? over there who were ready to give the information to Ukrainians. It is da it's dangerous, uh, you know, occupation. Uh, in Donetsk, uh, we had a lot of Ukrainian patriots and uh, who even called them patriots, you know, who just uh, think it was right to, uh, to fight again, to do something also, to do something against the, this new situation, against mm -hmm. invaders. You know, a lot of people in Donetsk, they supported the Ukrainian army and they um, leaked a lot of information, a lot, absolutely, about movements of Russians, about the um, warehouses, about the storage, storage of the weapon, everything. The Ukrainian part had all necessary information. Uh, Donetsk was transparent for Ukrainian forces, due to, and thanks to that people. Uh, it was uh, it was then, yeah? Yeah, uh, yeah, and yeah but, but now, how do you think? Uh, they are still people? They, they had eight years, mm. eight years to suppress Ukrainian moments, to uh, punish, uh, to capture, uh, to kill Ukrainians. Also, they had eight years to um, inflate uh, Donetsk with Russians who moved there from the so-called prosperous Russia. You know, thousands of people went to Donetsk and resettled, resettled to Donetsk, to the occupied city, uh, with uh, cut off electricity, water, with uh, huge problems, yeah? And uh, they appreciated it and felt their uh, living conditions improved. Mm as compared to that they had in Russia. You know? and, but uh, we still have Ukrainians in Donetsk. Mm -hmm. We still have people who are waiting there and who are helping, who are supporting. If you uh, open, for example, military reports currently to, to today, or open a map of the so-called partisan movement, uh, it's marked with uh, places of explosions, of um, Russia, mm, uh, any place, any place there, Russia uh, coming together, uh, uh, places they store their weapons, they store their uh, bombs, you know, it's, it's immediately is delivered and informed to Ukrainian side. Uh, it's, uh, my book, Dotya, uh, a lot of, uh, then uh, electronic vers version was not available. It's a few years ago, maybe years ago. 
uh, they, uh, we had many times then people bought paper version and brought to Donetsk. Uh, I asked them, what are you doing? You understand? It's very dangerous for you. Uh, she says, I'm putting it uh, under my clothing or uh, wrapped into the newspaper and put uh, in, my, in my bag and say, uh, they were bringing it. It's, it's real to Donetsk. And it's, for, for me, it's, it's, it's worth doing. Uh, for me, it's worth writing, you know, if yeah. people appreciate it and are ready to take risk to, to read it. To read it. And how about prototypes or heroes in, uh, of this book? Uh, are they well, st some of them? All main characters of this book have prototypes in real life. Um, a prototype of the main uh, heroine, uh, character, female character, it's uh, Natalia Hersimenko, a well-known uh, um, veteran and volunteer, a friend of mine. She's from Donetsk. Uh, she uh, initially li lived in Donetsk, then uh, moved to uh, Donetsk region. And we met and became friends uh, in Kurachove. It's a town in Donetsk region. And then uh, she moved to Lviv. Currently, she uh, then uh, invasion started last February. She uh, gathered kids for ex as far as in maybe 19 or 20 uh, kids from uh, children of uh, Ukrainian soldiers, and uh, she evacuated them to Netherlands and then to po Poland. She saved children. Yeah. And uh, uh, now uh, they're going to come back. Uh, I'm, I say not to do so, but, but we'll see. All of them, for me, absolutely all of them are, are real, uh, like uh, not fiction characters, but like persons. And uh, then working on this book, it was a constant dialogue in my, hand, mm -hmm. in my head, and I was hearing their voices all the time. And you know, it was my mission because uh, for me, as for author, it was very hard to do. So. It, it was a hard job, you know, hard work. It, it required, uh, it was very um, intense in terms of uh, recalling it, reflecting on it, uh, being very uh, depictive and careful in details. Uh, uh, and for me, it was a challenge also and a mission. And I do. I understood, understand now that uh, if I uh, didn't do it, nobody would. And these few people, few few kids, few few men and women, uh, who would be ignored and forgotten in Ukraine, and nobody would would even know about them and things they really did. You said uh, in, in one interview that it was important for you to make a book in Ukrainian about the war. So this was like a good start for Ukrainian language movement and literature to, to illustrating war, let's say. Uh, why it's so important to you? Ukrainization, let's say. Of, of uh, yeah, I, 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 I know people who started speak Ukrainian and read Ukrainian uh, f with my book. I have a reader, he is uh, currently he's 86, it's a senior man, you know, and he said to me it was the first book in Ukrainian language I, I, I read in my life, you know. Um, <laughs> People speak more Ukrainian nowadays, currently. Yeah, currently. yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah. We had... Um, <laughs> um, for me, uh, the language uh, always was more than a language. I understood and understand that it's, it's our line of defense. Uh, we have to protect our identity. Identity is a language you, speaks, you speak. You know? Um, it, it's the first sign that distinguishes us from Russians. Our language, our literature, our um, language we not only read, in, but we're thinking. You know? We have dreams, dreams in 
it's 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 very important uh, for example in Latvia I, I had a feeling that uh, you're overwhelmed with, with Russian language you know? uh, in, in, in Riga in Riga I uh, every time I, I, I heard Russian language I felt insecure and safe and a, it was a feeling of hostile environment because language is uh, it's uh, opening doors and windows to all other things. If we, we want to uh, secure our environment, to close against danger, against threats, we should close these gaps, we should close these windows. You know? it's, we should support and man maintain our language. Um, then uh, I was writing this book. Uh, a lot of it, it was a huge discussion in Ukraine as to um, about parity or possibility to write and read in Russia if these books are written in Russia by Ukrainian soldiers, Ukrainian veterans. And they said, look, if Ukrainian veterans speak Russia uh, and write Russia, Shall we read it? Shall, shall we appreciate it? Shall we ignore the linguistic aspect? You know? And I said, it's not about linguistic. You, know, you should better switch to Ukrainian. Sooner or later, you'll be forced to do it. Sooner or later. And current, now we have uh, exact situation. People are forced to switch. Because then speaking Russia here in Kiev, for example, I have to understand that uh, nearby could be people who suffered killing, torturous, uh, robberies, and who were humiliated, beaten, and raped by persons speaking Russia, by Russia soldiers. And my, for example, Russia language would uh, make situation for, for them even worse. I will re-traumatize re them, you know, mm -hmm. and it's my responsibility to um, be uh, careful and to protect and to um, safeguard these mm -hmm. people from new trauma and new negative experience. And language became the part of it. It's, it's, it's not our fault. It's totally fault of Russia. Russians. I found your interview, I guess, a few days before this big war broke out, and, and you said something like that, that you realized in Donbass um, some years ago that uh, Russia will go farther. They, they, they need uh, all of Ukraine, they need Europe, and they, they need uh, everything. What do you mean? How, how do you exactly the same. Get it? What did they say? Uh, moreover, I, I am sure now, if Ukraine will not stop them here, they will move and go further. Actually, you are the next target. Uh, Polish is the next target. Germany, uh, Czech Republic, Eastern Europe definitely is the next target. And what do they want? Resources. They want and they need resources. Uh, we had the illusion, the idea, they need some, they have some ideology, some beliefs, some mission on their hands, heads. No, they need washing machines, cars, jewelry, uh, currency stolen from Ukrainian houses. They need our machinery, our plants, um, our kids, children, and uh, a lot of our farms and animals, our, uh, they entered, for example, in uh, Bucha, a friend of, a friend of mine uh, lived in uh, a resident, residential complex. Uh, it's very European and uh, intended for middle class, for uh, uh, young families. For, for it's, uh, she, she told me, they entered every, everyone, every apartment, and just stolen everything they could, and uh, destroyed and damaged they couldn't. 
they shot TV sets if, if it uh, was too big to carry on, you know, to carry out. And uh, they ju uh, just stolen, uh, used home appliances. For us, it's a, it's a sign of why should one has to come 2,000 kilometers from the east, uh, far east of Russia to Ukraine just to stole a uh, kettle or a notebook or phone, used phone, you know, used um, Apple. It's, it's, it's so crazy, but they did. And they were happy and regarded this mission, their mission completed, successfully completed. I guess I have a suspicion, I have a, maybe their people, their, their country is very poor. Maybe people live in there because we saw, for example, uh, girls said, uh, young soldier for, for about 20 years. And he said to uh, them that for the first time in his life he uh, um, saw a, a notebook in real life and, and had it in, it in his hand. Because no, in his village no one resident had a notebook. They saw it on TV, but never in real life. Yeah. That's a reality. But the reality is that uh, uh, I want to come back to, to Ukrainian uh, political life. Uh, we've heard about these um, dismissals of uh, some um, officials uh, regarding corruption uh, during the war. What's the public opinion? How it happened? It, is it, you know, people are angry on that or are they just used to it? No, no. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking about z zero tolerance towards corruption, it's 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 right. It's it, it, as it is. Uh, ordinary people can't uh, tolerate it. Uh, but for me, it seems that uh, so-called corruption cases are very inflicted and pub published and promoted uh, not but by Ukrainians. It's a part of the Russia operations. It looks like we have a special a special operation of Russians in Ukraine and corruption, the so-called corruption, is a part of it. Uh, for example, speaking about huge corruption, uh, it turns out it's about um, middle rank uh, customs officers or middle rank uh, tax, tax officers, you know. Um, uh, as regards uh, Ministry of Defense and uh, a scandal about uh, corrupted um, uh, food supply agreement, for example, yeah, and it was reason why uh, deputy ministers were resigned, and the minister itself is uh, currently pending uh, resignation, and I think he will be changed, he will be removed from his position because of this particular contract. Uh, it's not uh, as big and as um, uh, this particular case. If one not as big as it looks, yeah. you know, if one uh, star is starting to look closer, uh, you will see that this agreement, this contract, was not. Um, uh, it was uh, rejected on the initial stage by internal mechanisms of the ministry itself. They stopped it and initiated a special commission to investigate into, into the case and they suspended a, a number of officials from, um, from the process just to investigate. And I think they, they will do it uh, properly. Uh, actually, um, the ministry uh, is doing a um, very important and big job in supporting, uh, the, uh, in uh, buying weapon and everything from the uh, different states, and in uh, they are, they are lo currently they are launching a very important contracts and process in Ukraine. For example, it's about internal production of very important weapon and uh, devices here. 
in Ukraine, and uh, it seems to me that they are quite efficient in it. And uh, external critics and maybe animal enemies also are trying to slow them down. Speaking about corruption, it's not about, for me, it's not about the um, military uh, purchases and not about the Ministry of Defense. Uh, we should be very careful and we should be vigilant and keep a constant eye on tendencies, tendencies and process in Ukraine. For example, uh, the lack of external controls on important um, uh, divisions uh, on the governmental and presidential, for example. Mm -hmm. It's bad for the state, it, for me, then uh, the supreme power is accumulated in hands of one person. Uh, president Zelensky has a, is a president, also he uh, has a political party which holds the majority in the parliament. And uh, uh, they can vote and pass um, absolutely a a any bills, any projects, using voices of uh, their own party. Uh, democracy needs an opposition. Democracy needs a control from the opposition. And opposition has to, is a watchdog, yeah? Yeah, but because it's a wartime, it's yeah. difficult to uh, make them in a, in a wartime, to be more important, let's say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the war time, our opposition, uh, speaking about Poroshenko and his party, for example, uh, a lot of people are fighting, others are volunteers and supporting the army. We have no time for any other projects. Yeah, uh, for projects, doing you know. other jobs. Uh, you mentioned uh, before interview that you started to learn Latvian language. It's <laughs> how, it, how it was going? It's a fiasco for me. Why? It absolutely uh, has nothing in common with Ukrainian. <laughs> I can't make any uh, analogies and I, I can't use my knowledge, for example, of Ukrainian, Russia, English to study Latvian. All words seem to be absolutely new, <laughs> it's, it's, but I, I'm trying, I, I, I will... Um, for, for very complicated language. You know, but uh, I think we have to know it, we have to try also. Uh, we have to try to speak and to understand languages of uh, other states uh, which are close to Ukrainian. Uh, in Polish, maybe uh, maybe Bulgarian. I mean, for me, it's uh, the ambitious goal is uh, Polish and Latvian, a big Latvian. I'm uh, willing to uh, come to Riga uh, one more time at least. Maybe after our victory, after the war, and I am I'm getting ready, I will prepare a speech in Latvian and to, uh, tell it to Dats and to her family. It would be a, uh, some kind of surprise, I guess, for them. Uh, How about Victory Day? Is it far? Yeah, yeah, it's far. Uh, I hope I will see it. But it's it's far far away. Uh, we're dealing with a very strong, resourceful, and crazy enemy. They will not stop voluntary. They will push further and further, and uh, the victory. Uh, you know, it will not be peace until Russian. Uh, until their military, political, economical systems would be defeated. Because uh, or any negotiations, any uh, frozen conflict uh, will give them more time to reconcile to, and to do the next attempt. And if they uh, succeed in it, the next wave, the next war, would be totally devastating, not only for Ukraine, but for the Europe uh, in total. I think maybe only British would survive. It, it would be a 
fleet of Arda. I don't know how to say it in English, but it would be a total invasion, you know. Uh, in our interests, uh, um, it's not about Putin. If it, if, if, it, if it was about Putin only, it would be much uh, more easier for us. But it's not about Putin, it's about the people in total. In total, in general, they support war. They legitimize it. Uh, they invade new goals and new, uh, find new arguments why should they suppress Ukraine and not only Ukraine. They hate not only Ukrainians, uh, they hate Latvians, they hate Estonians, hate, they hate Euro Europe. And um, I guess about two generations of kids were rising. Uh, in atmosphere of hatred towards Europe, towards civilizations. You know, it will not stop only by... Uh, just imagine what would happen to Europe and to the continent if, for example, Hitler and Nazi Germany uh, wasn't stopped. Just, just imagine that empire and state of minds and attitude and uh, the uh, paths and turns of civilization development. Tamara, you said that you want to go to Riga after a victory and give a speech in, in Latvian and I hope see you soon. <laughs> Tamara Duda, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.